So please, Adam, take yeah. it away. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, kia ora, good afternoon. Thank you for, for coming along. Second day, last stream session, just after lunch. So it's, yeah, thank you for making the effort. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm actually wearing two hats at Auckland Museum right now. Um, a sort of a slightly, uh, one I've been wearing for slightly longer and better fitting is a digital collection information manager. So I look after collections online, um, some of the data analysts in the museum, and our online cenotaph database. And that job is all about getting our data out of our source systems and publishing it online and encouraging remix and reuse of that content. And I've also just put on a, a slightly new hat, which is Acting Head of Information Library and Inquiry Services. And so that's managing uh, the Documentary Heritage Collection and the whole information ecosystem at the museum. Um, and as sort of mentioned, uh, Lucy mentioned, uh, this was originally actually a seven minute lightning talk that got extended to a 25 minute. And then 10 days ago, Dave Sanderson, the, one of the conference conveners, rung up and said, hey, uh, do you want to do a full hour? I said no. But um, <laughs> here we are. Isn't that? So we, we've got an hour together. Isn't that fantastic? Um, a crisis of capacity. This is, this is one of these things that's been, I've been working on in the back of my head for, uh, for about, I don't know, 18 months. And so it's actually really, really great to be here with you. And what, what we're going to do today is I'm just going to walk you through my journey um, through this problem that I've, I, keep, I keep coming to at the museum. And uh, my journey is just one way of, of getting through this. Uh, I'm not saying it's the only way. Um, and actually, I think I'm really interested in if you guys have done anything different, anything similar, or if you do, yeah, yeah, what we would do in this space. So I'm really excited to, uh, to share it with you. So crisis of capacity, what, what do I am I talking about? Hopefully I'm talking if this works. Oh no, I'll use the keyboard instead. There we are. And I think this, this is true maybe for my bit of the museum, that the bit that I work in, the, the collections and the collections online, is actually that it's not dropping visitation numbers that's the problem for us. It's the crisis of capacity that we're, we're, we're being asked to do a lot more with a, a lot less. Um, and, I mean, we've been doing this for a long time. Auckland Museum, we've been doing this for about 163 years and counting, and we've got a lot of stuff. Um, so art archives, a research library, uh, collections, um, uh, online cenotaph, the records of 200,000 servicemen and women who um, went overseas. Um, and, and this has created this huge backlog. And that's what keeps me up at night. I think about the backlog. And so for all of you who are pretending you don't know what the backlog is, it's the unprocessed collections that we, ha we haven't yet got to. Um, and I, I was speaking to our pictorial curator, who, and he, he reckoned we had 3 million unprocessed photographs in the collection. And at our current rate, that would take 75 years to get online. And, I, and that sort of boggles my mind. Um, and so that's, that's what I've been sort of thinking about. Well, how do we tackle this back, backlog? How do we make that 75 years, five years? Um, what technologies and tools can we use to do that? Um, I should quickly point out that Auckland Museum is doing amazing stuff in this space anyway. For those of you who saw Bob's talk yesterday about the Pacific Access Project, what that's doing is we closed one gallery, the Oceans and Coastal Gallery on the, the second floor, if you've been into the museum, and we turned that into the Collection Readiness and Access Project, where we put 16 people who are just working on backlogs from across the collections. Um, you've got Dave Sanderson's team in there, uh, I think it's six photographers, sort of productionizing how we um, take our images. And we've got copyright specialists and data analysts just cleaning up the backlog and trying to get as many new records online as fast as possible. And we're doing amazing things in that space. We've got 2,000 new records every month, 2,000 new images. And every day, we make about 4,000 updates to our collections online. So the way our system works is every five minutes, we, uh, we take a data dump from our three source systems, and we push that data online. And one of my favorite graphs to show people about this is, uh, is this one, which was uh, is a couple of months ago now. We have uh, 6 a.m. through to 8 p.m. And this is the number of up records updated on collections online. So you can see 6 a.m., the first brave souls reach the museum. And they start making the first couple of records. And they drop along. And then more people come on. And we, we go through. And then there's these people who just go home. You know, like there they are. They're making a difference. They're right till 8 p.m. Um, my favorite thing about this graph is it shows that we're an active. Um, we're not dusty and old. That We're generating new knowledge constantly. I also love this diagram for one brilliant reason. Is it, and, and I've worked in about four or five museums, and all of them have this pattern. I don't know if anyone can, anyone can guess the one I'm about to show you. Morning tea. <laughs> and you can just see that there, like absolute peak, as everyone saves their work, drops down. We see no, no, nothing going online, and then a 
a peak afterwards because everyone's full bellies, full of coffee, and they're ready to hit the floor again. You kind of see lunch and an afternoon tea hidden in there as well. And I just think, for me, that kind of sums up um, I know, every museum I've ever worked in. It's kind of like down towards 10.30. Um, so we, we've got all these collections, and we're trying to put it online, but we've also got this problem that um, we've got some, some changing expectations. Um, our audiences are expecting us to do this fast. Um, I mean, we've got people who you, you don't rent a video, you go and get Netflix. I, I mean, I haven't watched an advert in like three years. And it's people want their stuff and they want it now. Um, you, you want some food, you get it delivered on Uber. Um, and so how does the museum work with that? How do we, you know, that the people want it instantly? And my favorite story from when we did collections online, which we, we presented here uh, three years ago, or two years ago, um, we put a million records online, and we did that overnight. It was not overnight, but we, we released them overnight. And um, the first emails I got weren't, oh my god, you're amazing, you deserve a medal, which were naturally the emails I was expecting, but were ones like, oh, you didn't do this collection, or when's my donation going to be online? And so it's instantly people were kind of expecting that now we're, we're, we're starting to put things online, we should be doing it quicker, and they should be seeing their work up in, in five minutes. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of like the background of, of how do we deal with this. And then at last year's um, NDF, I don't know who was here, and if, if any, were many people here? Yeah, um, Dave Brown from Microsoft gave the, the keynote, and he showed us um, Caption AI, Caption Bot AI, uh, which is this awesome little tool where you upload an image, and it uses the Microsoft Cognitive Services, and it creates auto captions, and it creates tags, and it creates, um, it gives you some, some uh, metadata that you can add into your images. And I honestly left the last NDF sort of just think, this is it. Here's our solution. We're going to just throw all of these images through um, AI. We're going to get all those captions. I'm going to put them online. And then we, we'll be on top done, yeah, sorted. And I'll go home and have a cup of tea. And, um, and just, uh, I know Paul Rowe mentioned some of this yesterday, but. Uh, just what is computer vision and AI? Um, I'll try and sum it up in really quickly. It's just using, uh, you train a computer by feeding it visual information. Um, and then so when you show it something, it recognizes what it is. I kind of, I did have a diagram, but I've taken it out, which was uh, the way my toddler draws cars. You just, you know, you keep showing them the same picture and that's how he learns what it is. It's the same kind of thing. Um, and and it, it seemed like it was a really great way for us to move forward. I should quickly point out that I'm not suggesting that we use computers to replace our staff, um, but actually allowing us to tackle that backlog head on, but at the same time, uh, allowing the staff to do their jobs more efficiently and, and work on sort of the gnarlier problems that, that we come up against. And so I got back to NDF uh, from NDF last year, and I, I threw some images in. And so the first one, I mean, uh, it came up, a living room filled with furniture and a fireplace. The, this, the, this is using Microsoft Cognitive Services, 94%. Easy, and some, some pretty good tags. Indoor, living room, table, window, furniture, ceiling. Wood, wooden view, chair, field, fireplace, you know, large, decorate. I mean, that's, that's cool. That's, that's as good as I think we would have done if, uh, if a human had done it. And so, perfect, that, that record could go online. Of course, obviously, we have to show you some bad ones. Um, sheep in front of a building. It's, uh, but, but what's great there is we've got 9%, so we know this is kind of a bit crap. And we know, and it starts getting really weird. And you go building, outdoor house, grass front, sheep, here. We carry on a little bit long, horse. Uh, where's, where is it down? We get to, you know, train, zoo, field, riding tool, herd and track. No idea. But, you know, but we know that 9%, we know that's kind of a bit rubbish. Maybe that's one that has to go back into some other system. And uh, I, this one, which make, is even better because of yesterday's talk. Um, so it, it's not... Um, it's not a cell phone, as Paul Rowe's system did yesterday, but I don't know what AI has against babies. Um, and, and I don't, and, and just, yeah. It's really, I mean, it works really well with architecture, but you can see how we could really offend people. Um, but again, a quite a low confidence rating. Um, and the way I'd done this was just one record at a time. I just, uh, I was using that, that front uh, chatbot AI, and one, one by one. And um, of course, with the three million records, that was still gonna take me quite a while, so. I thought, I, I, can, I'm kind of, I can do a little bit of um, Python, and I am kind of know my way around APIs. I'm a little bit dangerous with them. And I opened up the documentation, and it was just like, I, I just couldn't. I couldn't make it work. I couldn't get 
our, our, our API to work with their API to get a response that was actually usable to put back into our source systems. I spent a bit of time, and then I just sort of like, meh, and I went back to my day-to-day -day job, which looks something like this. Um, and then I kind of forgot about this problem for, for like six months. It was just something I played with, I, I had a go, um, and then yeah, put, put it to the side. And actually, it was another, another little side project where I was trying to make um, a, a, uh, a Twitter bot. And um, I ended up on this forum, sort of, and someone was telling me I just needed to go and read the documentation. I shouldn't be asking such stupid questions. And I needed to go and read the book. And I was, I was over it. And I thought, well, I wish I could just pay someone to do this for me. Um, you know, <laughs> how much easier would that be? And I stumbled across um, the gig economy. And uh, I don't know if anyone's sort of been using this or looked or done, um, sort of been venturing into this space, but it's kind of weird and awesome at the same time. When we think about these things, um, we often think about uh, things like this, so uh, Airbnb, Uber, the sort of platform as a service where you're, you know, the platform acts as a, a place between the user and um, a provider, and that they're allowing these sort of mini, what we'd call micro-interactions or micro jobs costing somewhere between five and fifty dollars, completed by a freelancer using an online marketplace. And uh, I forgot to remove my image caption thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so you, we, you're kind of hearing a lot about it in the news, things like Uber and Airbnb, and this ability for us to access a workforce that's online. I mean, we already use freelancers, uh, but this allows us to access them anywhere in the world. And so I ended up um, looking at uh, these three sites. Uh, Fiverr, Upwork, and Freelancer, which are essentially sites where you can go and post small jobs costing anywhere between you know, $5 and $50, and you essentially invite people to, to help you out. And so I put my, my API question up there. I said, hey, can anyone take Auckland Museum's collection, take any one of these uh, Microsoft services, the, the, the AI system, and the response I want is a, uh, a JSON format, a JSON file that I can then import into our, our systems. And I wanted to sort of see if I could do that workflow really quickly. And, and you literally, you put it on a job, and you can see some of the, you know, from $15, $5. This was just when I think I just searched Excel to see what kind of things were coming up. And uh, I put it on, and 20 minutes later, someone had done the job. So I actually asked three different people to do it in the end, because I wanted to make sure I wasn't getting ripped off. And actually, they all provided me exactly the same thing, so I just paid for something three times. And it cost 15 bucks. <laughs> but then I was able to throw our images through. Um, and, and instantly, I'd, I'd cleared the first 1,000 images had, got, had gone and got tags. They'd got, um, you, know, you can see what the, the caption is, uh, the link to the, to the Auckland Museum collection, uh, the image, and then some tags. And this, was, this is in the format that we could then just quickly ingest into our source system and, um, and start putting these images online. So taking that first cut and, uh, and providing access to these collections that had previously been hidden. But we obviously have that problem of the, the, the captions. Um, and some of them being a little bit naff. And so I thought, well, could, this, could we use this same system to, to solve that problem? And I ended up looking at um, Amazon Botanical Kirk, Turk and Crowdflower. I don't know, has anyone used or heard of these two systems before? Um, yeah, they're kind of uh, the same as, as the other systems, but really the jobs are tiny. You're putting in um, uh, really small, uh, so if you're paying cents for jobs, and they're being distributed to thousands of people. And so it gives you a huge workforce that you can access, who can, who can work on these jobs, really simple jobs, and, and sort of churn through them. Um, in the end, I'll show you, I had to go on Crowdflower first. And this is, this is essentially what we asked. Uh, we gave them that, that Google spreadsheet in a slightly different format. So now you've got the image, the caption. Does the caption match the image? Yes, no. Uh, is it internal or external, which is just something we wanted to uh, check as, um, uh, I guess, to make sure someone wasn't just doing something, they weren't just throwing the images through really quickly. How many people were visible and transcribe any text. And, and this was getting done for about 18 cents an image. And so we could take all of those images that were under, I don't know, under 20% accuracy by the computer, by the AI system, and throw them through this system for a little charge and get them sort of proof checked. And, and then all the ones that said no, we could maybe then send back into the, into the pile, into the backlog to sit for that 75 years. Um, and, and up until this point, I should point out, so I've kind of you know, gone, NDF, yeah, we're going to use AI. It's going to be amazing. Then, oh, it's really hard. And then I was like, yeah, crowdsource, uh, gig source, we're going to be amazing. And so I'm still at this point. And then I, 
I, I went to Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk, and I actually didn't end up using it because um, I'll we'll talk about it why. But really, here you can see the job that this person that I, I'd signed up to do just to give it a run is we've got a, a Tesco receipt, we've got the content of the Tesco receipt, and then they're asking the people to fill it in. So it's really similar. It's you know really simple tasks that people can do. And of course, there's, there's huge advantages to this. Um, we really are just sort of embracing those changes that, the, that digital allows us. We've got a, a global workforce um, that we have access to at any time. Um, so I posted that job on Fiverr um, at night, and 20 minutes later, you know, 10 o'clock at night, someone had done it. And I was accessing this workforce in Europe that was able to do, do this for me. Um, we're, we're obviously only paying for the work we need, and we're gaining expertise at really a fraction of the cost, um, you know, five bucks. And it kind of lives all, all those keywords. It's lean and agile, and we're doing problem solving. And straight away, we got collections online that were searchable and usable. So um, it's not, it, obviously, there's a but. Um, but that, that Amazon Mechanical Turk site kind of gave me there was something, something a bit weird about it. I didn't, didn't quite like it. And I'll, I'll just go back to it. To do this transcription, we're paying eight cents for the first 20 items, and then a cent bonus for every additional four. And I was sort of sitting there going, man, that's so cheap. I mean, we could pay for this using like the office swear jar. And like, <laughs> we could actually pay for a lot more. Um, and uh, and, and it just that, that, that money just seemed quite, I don't know, it, it, it seemed like there was something a bit dodgy about that. That seems like you're getting quite a lot for not too much money. And so I started doing research and jumping into into what, what actually it is. And of course, you can't go online and start searching about the gig economy without finding some of the, uh, these articles coming up. Um, yeah, robots have arrived, but they're, they're actually made of flesh and bones, and freedom will serve them. Um, and some of the, the articles reckon that it's actually really hard, and I tried doing it with both of the systems, to work out what actually I was paying someone. Because when you're paying someone eight cents for 20 items, and then a, four, a one cent bonus for every four items, it's really hard to work out an hourly wage, and actually it works at about $1.45. Um, and then I started feeling really bad, um, <laughs> because we, had, you know, we have some really good code of ethics in the museum sector. And uh, these are things that we, we are held up to uh, working in this amazing sector, and that we will provide uh, appropriate financial rewards for the duties specified, museums out there. Um, and also, and also you know, ICOM. Uh, there's a principle there that members of the museum profession should observe and accept standards of law, and we should safeguard the public against illegal or unethical practices. And I just quickly, bearing in mind this is recorded, and I'm going, it goes on YouTube, um, I'm not saying that these services are illegal or unethical or are doing anything wrong. But what I'm saying is I didn't know, and it's really hard to find out. And is this something where we should be going in and should be trialing? Or is it something actually we go, well, let's, take a, let's take a step back? Um, because we don't know where that money is going. We don't know who we're, we're paying. We don't know if they have the, the same labor laws, or uh, I don't know, are we just funding someone in a little digital factory somewhere who's churning up my captions for me? And so I was sort of, after this initial, like, this is amazing, we're going to really churn through this, I actually said, ah, no, it, it's, it's maybe a little bit scary, and maybe it's something we need to take a step back. Maybe we need to look at the fair trade version. Um, or we have the money, so maybe we shouldn't be paying the absolute bare minimum of eight cents and be paying slightly more for it. And so we still have the problem. I still have all those images. They're all tagged, uh, and I need to check them before they go online. And so naturally, after the, the gig economy, I went back to something slightly more traditional, crowdsourcing. So again, uh, anyone use the Zooniverse project maker? Yay! And, um, and obviously, the Smithsonian Transcription Service, amazing services that give you a crowd of people who, who will do this for free, who are dedicated, uh, awesome people who want to help us. Um, I guess the, 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 the concern I had with this is it takes a while for you to, pay, to build the system and to get the crowd. And also, you're competing against all these other awesome projects. And my project was kind of a bit rubbish, because I just wanted you to say, does this picture match this caption? And, um, and I also wanted immediate results because I watch, you know, I'm part of the problem. I want everything now. Um, and uh, I was sitting at work, uh, sort of going through this, and uh, we I was uh, sitting in a, an all staff meeting, um, which is when all the staff meet. Um, and I was watching everyone come in, and I, I sort of realized um, that actually, actually, I had a crowd. I had this really awesome, passionate crowd who were sort of all around me, who wanted to help, and were in here getting paid and meeting all those ethical standards. A crowd of people who I just had to find how to get engaged. There's about 300 of them. 
And um, they all work at Auckland Museum, but the problem is they're all busy. Um, they're a beautiful bunch of people, but they're doing, they're already cataloging images for me. Uh, they're cataloging images for the organization. They're making digital content. They're doing research. They're uh, staffing the desks. Um, and so they're, they're already busy. So how could they help with this really small task? Um, how could they help us get through uh, that backlog? Um, and then, and then it, I remembered something. Um, I remembered my graph. And I remembered actually a bunch of them are doing nothing here at 10.30 because they're just drinking tea. <laughs> and so what could I do in this space to get them to help me? Um, and, and, and so I went through this kind of weird phase of thinking, well, um, so I went and stood in the staff room and I thought, well, here's all these people. They're coming and going and they're looking for things to do. And I, I, at one point I was building um, a little tower where people would put their tea bags and that would describe which was the best caption. But that then involved me having to empty out tea bags and um, it was, there was still quite a physical element. And so I was looking uh, and just literally standing in the staff room thinking about how, how could I utilize this space? How could I make the people who are, who are in here who are just sort of mindlessly flicking through their phones while they have their cup of coffee and help us tackle a backlog and help us work with the collection? And it kind of struck me there they all were on their phones. And so I started looking um, at, at chatbots. Um, I've just got my facts here, so I'll just quickly, this is from a study by, uh, which says that we spend five hours on smartphones every day. Um, and about 65% of that time is spent on communication-related activities like social media, texting, emailing, and phone calls. That's three hours, 15 minutes. So three hours, 15 minutes every day where we are, we're sitting on our phones just browsing and flicking through. Um, and mostly on social media apps. Uh, I'm going to use Facebook as my example for this. So a chatbot is essentially a really simple computer program which allows you to sort of do like a volleyball, or I think they use tennis, of um, preset conversations that um, we can throw you uh, some text, you respond, and then it's a bit like the old um, pick a path books uh, as kids you, you had, you know. And so you just have to build that map, and then you can give it to people, and they can pick their own path, and as they do that, we can collect data and use it to enrich our uh, collections. So I looked, at, I looked at three examples. I looked at Chat, Chatfield, Dexter, and SQL. And to be honest, all of them are awesome. I, wouldn't, I, I, I went with Chatfuel just because um, it has some natural language processing. So that means that it, uh, as users type in uh, their text, we can, we can recognize roughly what they're saying and help them pick that path. And it, can, um, it also allows you, to be honest, um, to add some really funny little, because um, people can ask funny questions and you can give them funny answers. So where um, the other two do the pick a path thing really well. Um, so. What, what does that look like? It, it really is this simple as you, you're building these text blocks. And you can take the user attributes that are coming from Facebook and build them in. And you, I mean, you're even picking how long do you want those little dot, dot, dots to appear. Um, and and we, could, we could come up with some buttons and uh, help people through. And also, if um, as people entered text, we'd be capturing it as user attributes that could then be emailed and stored in a Google Sheet. So we could. Um, really simply create this, this uh, Facebook bot that was already on everyone's phone because it uses Facebook Messenger that we'd be allowing people to talk to. Um, and at the same time, they'd be adding some keywords and recognizing the, the bit that isn't in here is the section that says, uh, does this caption match the image? Because we'd send them the image. Um, and so to make, to make this work, you also I realized a photo of me saying, help us tag collections wasn't going to work. So I decided to use Carbine, uh, the stuffed horse from the collection, as my kind of mascot, and posted up a bunch of posters around the museum asking people to talk to a horse. And so I gave the chat, the, the chat bot a, um, this personality of, of, of Carbine and um, invited staff to, to talk and to help us tag some of our collections. Um, you can scan. This is one of the, the, the QR codes from Facebook. Um, I don't know if it's called a QR code, but yeah, it must be. Um, and you can scan that and jump straight to the, to the chat box. It's still up and running. Or you can, you can actually search for Carbine, uh, the image tagging horse. And so I made sure that I stuck these posters up um, between the dirty dishwasher and the bins where I knew people congregate waiting for the, for the microwaves. We've done it for us. That's our, our sort of central point. And in a 10-day period, um, 33 members of staff helped complete uh, about, 100 and, uh, about 120 images which in 10 days isn't that bad. That's work that was never actually going to happen. Um, and, and sort of 
the great thing about it is because these were staff members, we didn't have to, um, we didn't have to upskill them on anything. They, they know what, how to catalog a record, or most of them have some idea of how to do it. And we didn't have to throw each image past multiple people because we could kind of accept that um, they, they kind of knew, knew what it was. And, and if, they, if a member of staff was saying, this caption doesn't match, we could take that as given. It's not, not like when we're paying eight cents for something where we maybe would have to run each image multiple times to make sure that we're getting the right uh, the right answer. Um, just, I mean, you're more than welcome to have a look, but that, that's kind of what it looks like and that those, um, as it comes up, so we throw someone an image, we show them what the AI captioned it as, we ask them, does this uh, caption match the image? And then we ask them for additional metadata that we'd add in. And so if we go back to, um, uh, to what, this is what the AI captioned it as, I'm remembering our, our awesome bird train and horse at the bottom and pier. Um, when this went back to, to, the, um, to the staff, of course we got a scientific name. Why wouldn't we? And we got versions of, of uh, the Maori names and, and uh, common names for the grass. And we also got some really cool things. I haven't included them here, but people would say things uh, that the non catalogers so the people who were just coming to this because they worked in exhibitions or they worked in uh, the, the visitor services team were adding things just like beautiful or pretty, you know, blue sky and balcony, the sort of terms that wouldn't necessarily be captured through our standard um, cataloging process. Um, and of course, so that, that worked with that one, but also here we have a, uh, the, the AI captioned this as a, a castle-like building in the city. Most people agreed that that was actually quite good, but people also added these, um, uh, you know, obviously the additional, the additional data. We got addresses and names and um, you know, Gothic Revival architecture and Dunedin. And so we were, we were utilizing that, that pool of knowledge that we have in our staff uh, and in a fun and engaging way, asking them to actually help us get through some of this stuff. Um, yeah. I, didn't, I don't think I put the baby one in, in the end, because we just said that was a no. And so, the, the so what? what? What that journey there is, I, I took um, the inspiration from NDF to go and do some, some AI work. I got stuck. I went and found the gig economy and used this online uh, the marketplace to try and help solve a problem. Realized that's a bit dodgy, a bit ethical, and I'm not too sure about it, and I'm not sure it's something that we as a, as a museum wanted to be involved in. Went back to crowdsourcing, uh, decided not to use that and decided on niche sourcing, which is something I've just made up, um, which is using that crowd, that, that niche audience that already exists in the museum and asking them to help us. And so really, it, for me, it was just like sort of, I don't know, putting a jigsaw together and not knowing where all the pieces were and some of the pieces are kind of far away and not maybe they, they're from a different puzzle. And, um, but I, I do think this is the kind of stuff where we shouldn't be sitting idly by and letting these technologies and these things pass us. We need to be jumping in and giving it a go and seeing uh, if we can use them. And can we, we don't have to, so some of the talks today, you know, give it a go, if it fails, that's fine. At least we tried. Um, and so I kind of, as, as we sort of said at the beginning, that was, that was the original talk that I wanted. Um, and, but I kind of just wanted to see what people thought about th those ethical issues around using that gig economy, the global economy, uh, even around using things like Facebook. I mean. Um, if, if, you, if you use Carbine, the image tag in horse, you can, you can ask it the word creepy, and it will send you all the data that we've collected from your Facebook profile that gets provided with your user attributes. Um, it's not too much, but it's still kind of creepy. It's your, your profile picture, your name, your, you know, uh, uh, where you're from. Is that the kind of information that we want to be taking off people? Should we be using these kind of sites? Um, and uh, yeah, no, no, yeah, the ethical question, should we be using uh, these tools? And has anyone got any other examples of where they've been using AI and how they've managed to cross some of those bridges around the accuracy? And, and is that, do we still need to have a human or someone come in and, and proof check everything? Um, yeah, and uh, so the only other thing, the only other comment that came a lot through, through all of the captions that came through uh, and through the chatbot is next time, if you're going to make a chatbot for a museum audience, um, you probably shouldn't use a horse. We should know our audiences. Go for a cat. <laughs> Everyone, that's honestly the most common, uh, common comment that came through. But thank you. Awesome. I'd just like to know, so you 
started, when did, when did this, when did your chatbot start? When did yep. it finish? You talked about 100 and... Yeah, so we, 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 did, uh, we did 10 days just because we, we wanted to sort of trial what that would look like and, and uh, realizing this isn't a long-term project, it, it really was just a pilot. Um, and we did, uh, in those, those 10 days, we had 33 people uh, come and tag about 100 and, uh, 120 images. So we found that it was, uh, it was the same people who were just kind of just scrolling through and, and doing it in their breaks. We could, we could plot those times and it was during breaks and... Um, and um, 33 people still, you know, it's 10% of our staff who, who got involved, so that's, yeah. So that was a pilot. Do you have plans, or, or did you, because you're a big problem solver, so you might have identified some issues, how would you make that an ongoing solution? Because it sounds like you've captured uh, people's imagination there. I yeah. just wonder how you could roll that out in a way that could be a long-term so solution for that yeah. problem. I think, I think we first need to get through some of those, those kind of those challenges around using these platforms. And um, I guess as a museum decide, is that something we, we want to be doing? I think that, that for me, this, this little pilot showed that it, we could use um, an existing system. Uh, that, I mean, the, all those systems that I showed you have free tier accounts. I think like the first um, 500,000 users, you get a free tier and we're not, that's not going to be a problem for us. Um, and it just sort of was a way of us testing, would people do this on their phones? Would they engage? And what was the quality of the data that was coming out compared to what the, uh, the automated systems were creating? And I think going forward, it's just, we, I think we want to get into crowdsourcing more and looking at how we can utilize the, those existing big platforms like Zooniverse. And this was just a way of us kind of cheekily checking uh, if, if it would work and checking even, I mean, the great thing about these, these systems is you can change them on the fly. So we were able to do some real simple testing of the language and around what, you know, when uh, the first couple of users said they hated one bit, we were able to just quickly jump in, change it, and, and really slim it down so that people could, um, yeah, just, just play along and, and, yeah, see if we can make it a little bit fun. Yeah. Cool. Um, I was just wondering, uh, given that you're using these third-party services and you're effectively uploading your data to them, um, yep. what uh, terms they might ask of you That's, with yep. respect to rights in your images? So what we, because uh, rights and that right management of uploading into the content was something that we were really concerned about. And um, what we're actually doing is just linking to our, our API image. So we're trying not to upload content, which was one of the reasons we chose. We looked at those three different systems. We wanted to avoid anything that was storing data in a, in a like we didn't want to give Facebook all of our collection images. That's not the, uh, not, not what we're up against. Um, and so yeah, it's definitely something that we need to be mindful of and keeping checking in of what those services and their terms. Um, and that's why I think that, the, I mean, as a point, I don't have the answer. I just think it's part of that discussion of when we start looking at these, um, yeah, what is the, what, what things do we need to be aware of in this sort of yeah, sphere of, uh, sort of te tools and te technologies? Um, it's the same as the thing on yesterday, the shiny tool. We're, we're quick to jump on it, but we need to make sure that we're taking everything into account. And it's the same as when we uploaded things into um, uh, Crowdflower. And, and the reason, one of the reasons we didn't go forth with uh, the Amazon was because we weren't, it was just so technical, we didn't want to get into that. Thanks, Adam. What was your plan, pretending that you're going to go forward, or with those 100 records that got tagged, what was your plan for that data? Yep. How was that going to go back into your contact management system in a meaningful way? Does it, so what, um, what we're looking at is that there's two types of um, uh, ways we were looking at dealing with that. One is just a, a, a straight ingestion into our source system but then tagging that as an automated record. So flagging to the user and to our, our, our collection management team that actually this has never been seen by a human. This is just like a stub skeletal record just for access. Um, and the other option was when we have had someone go through it is adding them as like user tags. So in the same way that we allow users to come in and add their own commentary to records online, it was kind of the same way. So we're removing the museum as kind of saying, we didn't, we didn't write this. Uh, this is, it's essentially a user, and in this case, the user just happened to be uh, a Microsoft AI system. Yeah, so if that's... Um, I think the other thing to bear in mind as well is that a lot of this tagging and stuff is about um, discoverability, and you can't get feedback from people if they don't see what's there. <laughs> 
So it may be just this first, first yeah. step of... That's the thing, it's that, that first cut just to get the data online so that people can find our content. And then, they, yeah, you're right, they start that loop um, and, and people went, you know, at least those records, even though it said zoo and sheep and farm, at least they were findable. At least someone could use them, remix them, and, and tell us if, if they were incorrect and we could, we could fix them. Better than sitting in the, that, that backlog. Yeah. So we, um, being able to take it out to a market that we never would have been able to catch up, one yep. being in Canberra, which is an issue, um, and second for us being a lot of the people with the Digivol are natural scientists, so a lot of people are probably here in natural history collections, which is not generally what a visual arts community engage with. Yep. Um, so more than anything, it's probably my suggestion, and I'd love to talk to you about it kind of further, um, but around that actually sometimes you can see these as getting the collection open and sometimes that's as much of a benefit as what you actually get out of it as yeah. well. And that's, yeah, I mean, really one, of the, one of the silly things about this was we had people you know, looking at our collection items from yeah, the exhibitions and visitor host team who are marketing who never have seen these and were just kind of like, this is awesome. And, and, and also there's that kind of like, I can catalog, you know, I'm a, I'm a collection manager now, this is easy. Um, and so managing that expectation as well. And, and making sure we walk, walk our collection teams through that, that this isn't in any way, shape or form, it's just, it's helping enrich. Ready. You can also say it's wholesome. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, <laughs> that, that wasn't why I wanted the microphone. Um, I, I guess my question is really my problem, not your problem, but um, I wonder how many people in this room would be able to pay the $8 in their institution. Um, I know yep. I, don't, I have a manager who's got a P card, but we have to find something to charge it to. We don't yep. have that magic... Uh, that magic line to charge that, and there's a lot of things out there that you know I'd be happy to pay eight dollars for, or yeah. you know sixteen dollars or whatever. But um, do, do other people can they just you know have they got their credit cards? Yeah. So they can I mean, I have to, and I quickly, I guess I didn't allude to that, but because this was a kind of a, pro I did this mostly in my own time at home, and so the quickest way around that was using my my credit card to get it done, and um, and yeah, that's you know that problem of how do we, yeah, no, nothing more to add on that. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, thanks for that. Um, I'm just curious about the effect in institutions of potentially concealing this sort of work in things like break periods or um, into the kind of gaps between existing work. Yeah. Um, and what effect that potentially has on selling to management or selling to more senior people in the organisation that there is a problem of capacity here that might need some more uh, long-term solutions? Yeah, I'm I, not entirely sure. I mean, for us, again, we just chose that lunchtime thing because it was, it was cool, to be honest, it was funny. And um, it was just we noticed there was this, this group of people who were sitting... Um, you know, browsing through the old magazine that's been in the staff room for the last 12 years. And, and we just thought, was this a way of us getting, uh, getting it in front of them? I think being able to pull out some of that, those metrics and that data around what our systems are currently, you know, 4,000 updates across a team of, of 30 is pretty insane when you sort of see that and being able to show that data and to show those, those massive drops when, when people are exhausted and they need their coffee and their, their, um, their tea. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I don't know, has anyone else got a suggestion of how, how to do that? I'm open to the floor. Um, this may not be that suggestion of how to do that. <laughs> um, just hearing you talk about using that, um, that uh, niche targeted crowdfunding <coughs> makes me wonder about those times in our institutions, especially, say, to Papa and 
and the big ones where there are queues and people waiting for things and, and that yeah. opportunity to look at your immediate audience. So people waiting for their coffees, people waiting in lines for stuff like yeah. Calipoli, um here at Te Papa and things like that. There is an opportunity there to get an engaged audience to feel like they belong and are participating in the yeah. museum and those environments. And, and again, because of the, the, those upload cycles, we can show that as quite an immediate, um, their, their, their records appearing online quite quickly. Um, and I think you know, one of the, the ideas around that, that niche sourcing that we were playing with was could we take, um, uh, you know, where we have, uh, like, uh, we have some botany uh, students coming in, could they help us tag those? Because we got scientific names out of those pictorials. So could we um, find those groups that are already coming into the museum with really specialist knowledge and then show them something that has nothing to do with their specialism, but see if they can enrich it? So in that case, adding um, botanical names to pictorial images. Um, could, when we have collections of um, art of uh, botanical prints or, or fish, which we, we have, could we show that to people who n wouldn't normally see it? And they then get exposure to our collections, but also help enrich. Um, I think it's a really interesting, yeah, how we, how we start using that niche audience and how we put our content in front of them. Yeah. Uh, on a similar subject, at the Christchurch Art Gallery, we use the Friends of the And the and, and seeing some benefits of helping. And we brought them in and gave them scones and that yeah. sort of thing. Awesome. Right. Um, just on a personal note, I thought it was Hi. really interesting that about the tea time thing. Yeah. Because the yeah. sacredness of my coffee time in the morning. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I'm a person who not only works for the museum, but I also crowdsource other museum stuff outside my workouts. I'm one of those obsessive types of people. Yeah. But if you took over my staff tea time, I'd be really like, oh. Yes. So, I mean, it's just interesting that you've got uptake for that as yeah. well. Because um, coming into November and December, it's also a bit of burnout time for mm -hmm. people in our sector. Yep. Um, so recognizing that as well. Um, that said, I also wanted to say, it's perfect for crowdsourcing. You should put it out there. I'd love to contribute That's in the evening. Awesome. <laughs> Yay. And I think, you know, and I should, it was, we were inviting people, so I, I definitely wasn't standing with my stick uh, next to the dishwasher, um, getting people to sign up. And uh, it was really interesting to see how um, uh, the, the first few people to take it up weren't, weren't the collection staff, who I thought, I thought it was instantly going to be like our pictorial team, who were going to kind of be checking in on me. Uh, and it was just people who were, like say, um, the, the object was trying, you can tag hopefully an image in sort of the, the one minute 30 it takes to heat up a pot noodle or I know, microwave your quinoa salad. And, um, and so that, try and make that, so while people have got that dead time waiting for the coffee to brew or to, yeah. I think over this side. Hi. Okay. Um, Interested to see the misclassification of a person with a baby yeah. as someone holding a baseball bat. Um, that that is unusual, and it, it was rather like the one of a of a baby being misinterpreted as a mobile yeah. phone the other day. Um, and I wonder, though, specifically the th the image of a baseball bat struck me as as slightly incongruous in a New Zealand context because it's not really a, a New Zealand sport. And it struck me that uh, yeah. perhaps this is indicative that the the AI had not been really trained on yeah. an appropriate corpus. Um, That's, yeah, and we, we've seen that with uh, another project that we've just done with our uh, uh, doing text extraction on for longitude latitudes of places where, the, again, using Microsoft Cognitive Services, where everything defaulted to the Cambridge in America, not the local. And so how we can help train our own models to, to work forward on that. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It, it, it seemed to me that, the, that a hybrid approach where yeah. you actually then train these AIs based on the, the captions that you have created um, either you know by your yeah. actual uh, you know, cataloging staff or through a crowdsourcing process, you yeah. could actually get the best of both worlds. That's it. And we so we've got a million images in that in that collection already online. So we've got that ready just to to throw across and to start building. Um, and you can see there's definitely some. Um, Oh man, that's going to be this year's thing I take away from NDF is I need to build the the, uh, the New Zealand model because um, you can see with architectural and uh, yeah, there's definitely a, a niche gap there that we could we could start filling. Hi, David. Um, just on the point of invading people's tea breaks and so forth, I suspect that there was a bit of novelty in yes. this current experiment. Yep. But it does suggest to me that there's an opportunity for us as museum managers, and I'll just declare I'm 
Spectrum's manager here, so I, I'm saying that with full disclosure, um, that we could think about people's, the rigidity of people's job descriptions and that there's an opportunity across an organisation to, to foster interest in other people's areas of work mm. and make it a legitimate part so that 15 minutes of anybody's day legitimately as part of their work could be part of, could be doing this kind of thing. Yeah as a way of finding out what else is in the collection, what, what are the hopes and aspirations for, for their colleagues across other parts of the organisation. Because realistically, 15 minutes less of your core task is not going to make a hell of a difference. But it might inspire you to be more connected to the place you work for. So I'd be really keen to follow that up. Yay. <laughs> Um, on that point, and coming back to the finances, the fact you had to use your personal credit card to be um, to yep. to be a bit innovative, um, and following on from the leaders' talk, I'm just wondering if a clear message has to be sent back to our managers regarding the financial criteria of uh, playing around and innovating yep. with even a small bit of cash, and how hard it is. Because you know, I too am a budget manager, and the hoops you have to go through to spend eight dollars mm. is quite extensive. Um, you know, and, and how how can we as a sector or within our own institutions have a small pot of money that you're allowed to play with? Yep. Now those small and those that and, and innovation doesn't have to be the sort of the mahuki twenty thousand dollar. It can be five bucks, and if it all goes horribly wrong, that was only a coffee that we've wasted. There, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, two things. Uh, just an answer to your point. Uh, our council is, uh, has just developed a an innovation fund. If you can come up with a, you know, a clever idea that costs two or three hundred bucks, and uh, you think it'll save a whole lot or intervene in a problem that's uh, getting out of hand or what have you, you know, they will uh, awesome. literally hand the cash over, and you can go and buy the staff bike yeah. or whatever it is you think uh, uh, will help. Uh, so that's one solution, um, and it, and it's quite an attractive one to. Uh, to councils because of course they can then tout the ideas as their own yeah. um, and secondly uh, this is Adam and myself Paul we, we're from Marston was there any intended significance in that band photo you showed for the gig economy because that's our senior archivist and we're is a bit weirded out no way <laughs> um, no I just I, I was on I used digital New Zealand for all the images and I just searched gig and uh, yeah, the, oh man, there's that one. No, that one. Yeah, he's the guy on the right. He's one of your contributors. It's Neil Francis. Awesome. <laughs> there we go. Um, now, honestly, that was just, that was a digital New Zealand find page one. There we are. Hi, I'm just, I don't want to sound like the Grinch at Christmas, and I'm totally going go for to, it. so sorry about that. Nonsense. No worries. Because it's I guess one of the things that I'm interested in, because what I've been doing for a number of years is inventory search, is while it's great, as more collections get opened up and they're more digitally accessible, that's great. But for me, as a researcher, having something that says house, totally. it's not a helpful, do you know what I mean? Yep. If you do that on Digital New Zealand, you get 100,000 pictures. As a way of actually researching, you know, I, I get worried sometimes that losing the specialist knowledge from those descriptions yep. is actually going to make it's not it, you know for people who want an image of something for maybe I don't know a Christmas card that's you know yep, yep that opens up the collections but it in some ways also really limits stuff that's, so and I think just, there's sorry yeah. and I think there's a way of us how we how we start showing this information online so we need to know that our, our collections that have been seen by a curator collection manager collection tech or volunteer that has gone through that process um, and, and has all those links and those connections that make, make the search powerful, you know, show me everything depicting X from Y. Um, maybe we need to, when something's gone through a process like this, it needs to be the sort of tick box removed from search because we know that you, if you're looking for photos of babies, the baseball bat one's not going to help. And so it's, it's how do we show that this record is a like a stub record created automatically and then allowing the user to remove those from their search if they don't want it um, and only use the records that we know have gone through the, the standard museum process of cataloging 
Um, and, and we, we kind of have that on collections online, on Auckland Museum's collections online, with a, um, a scale of completeness. So you can, you, you know, the, the ones that are sort of, nothing gets to 100%, but the ones that are sort of 90% are the, the ones that have gone, have had that curatorial research, have been using exhibitions, and they're kind of awesome. And then we've got the lower percentage ones, which are the, if you're looking through, you kind of know this is, it's a stub. You just, it's just there for access. You can scroll right through. Yeah, awesome. Cheers. Um, I'm kind of curious whether you did this work in the presence or absence of an institutional policy around user contributions to your metadata. We, uh, because we have Online Cenotaph, um, which is a uh, database of 200,000 servicemen and women, and that allows contributions. So we've kind of already started having these conversations. Well, we've been having them for uh, the last three years around uh, allowing people to add their own content to our collections uh, in the terms of biographical notes, new photos, and um, just different data. Uh, and with our own collections online, we allowed that tagging and uh, sort of um, enrichment that we just, this is kind of just the next step of that. So we've started, we started having those conversations and this was just kind of the next, uh, the next step in the progression of, instead of it being a, a user sitting at home typing it, what, what's it when it's a, either a member of staff or a computer doing it, but yeah. I, I actually didn't think we were going to make an hour. I was like, I thought this was going to be like 33 minutes and we were all going to be out drinking coffee. But I don't know if anyone, any, anyone's got the last question or, oh, two, howdy, we got the. Uh, it's not really, maybe it's a question. Um, I'm just wondering whether the NDF community itself could be, become a niche community to help people, especially from maybe smaller institutions yeah. to come up with ideas and iterate and test them with a, a specialist audience who yeah. can then, in the process, learn from what other people in the community are doing. That's it. I mean, to be honest, if we only got to 33 minutes, I was going to force you all to use it and just to, <laughs> just to get another 50 people sort of uh, tagging my images. <laughs> but no, again, is it, we, we have this niche. It's the same as using the museum, and you guys are going to be the, some great critics because we're all going through the same things. How do you... Yeah. Yeah, I was just interested in the gig economy aspect and, yeah, and that essentially if you paid that eight cents, you're sort of contracting out some of your work and yep. whether that was something you'd just thought about discussing with the unit or if you were going to pursue that further. Yeah, so, that, I mean, we did the, the, the first, after the first little bit, we went and I, I did check in with our, our P&O colleagues, our, our people in the organisation, just to make sure I wasn't doing anything I, I definitely shouldn't. Um, and, it, and it's just, I guess, being aware that it, even though something is only costing eight cents, that it, you're right, you are essentially contracting out and you're paying someone for, to, uh, to work on a museum collection. And that's kind of a weird, which is why we, we, we I say as that, on that uh, sort of inflated, this is amazing, I'm going to do everything, it's five dollars, and I, I've solved 75 years worth of work, amazing. Um, and actually, that's a reality hit of, there is this huge ethical and legal problem that, it, and I'm not quite sure, it's really hard with the terms of reference on those sites to kind of work out exactly who you're paying, what you're paying, and like I say, even those, those rules around what your hourly rate you're giving is. And, and maybe until we know what those are, that's maybe we should be just taking a step back and looking at other solutions where we could maybe only be looking at a New Zealand audience or only be looking um, to pay fair wage and yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good reminder that our work may have ethical dimensions that that's we don't always think of immediately. So yeah, thank you. awesome, thank you. Cool, I think, oh, one more? What some of those platforms have profiles of the people that are doing their work, yes. and that might be a way of looking at it ethically and evaluating with more information. Yeah, Upwork and so on. Awesome. I'm sorry, David, did you? No, no just to add to that comment about um, the issue about contracting out and are we taking away work that our staff would have done and so forth. We've already dealt with that with the 300 volunteers that we have, and we have quite um, clear guidelines as to what's, a, what's suitable for volunteers to do that isn't taking away from paid work um, and so this is within that context. So it's, it's, it's territory that we've already covered, it's just a different version of it. Awesome. Cool, thank you very much. I'm actually amazed we made now. <laughs> I can't believe it. Awesome, thank you very much, thanks for listening and uh, yeah, have a go. Cool.